to uh, CQ for uh, inviting me to speak today. Um, oops, while I wait for this to come up. Um, <clears throat> Johnson Matthew, you may know, is a, is a significant fabricator of TGM um, products. Um, my role there as head of market research is primarily actually long term uh, forecasting of supply and demand fundamentals, which we do on behalf of our, uh, our own businesses, manufacturing businesses, as well as uh, for Anglo American Platinum's long term strategic planning mind. So I spend most of my time looking, looking into the future. But uh, Eric has given us a, a view of the fundamentals and so what I'm going to focus on is some of the less known applications for the uh, patent group metals. I, I can see now that this audience is largely composed of investors so what I'll try and do as I go through this is to try to give some insight my feelings as to the price elasticity of demand of some of these uh, applications um, because I think you'll see that largely platinum group metals in industry are very price inelastic. Um, and that's quite important and underlies I think, a lot of the investment that's going on in, in EGMs at the moment. These are industrial metals and they're backed by solid industrial requirements. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about why people use PGM. Uh, I'll touch on the major non-catalytic applications because you'll see that most applications are catalytic. Um, and then I'm going to go into this uh, where else are PGM used and why so that you can maybe understand a little bit more about the metals and what they are. Um, and if we start with why do use, people use PGM, um, I looked at the total demand uh, for all of the platinum group metals except osmium. So platinum, palladium, rhodium, ruthenium, and iridium together. And then I looked at how much of that total demand was actually used in, in, in catalysts in some shape or form. So we're not just talking about auto catalysts here, we're talking about electrocatalysts, electro winning, uh, fuel cells, any type of catalyst maybe in the process uh, chemicals industry and found that 57% of that gross demand is a some form of catalyst. But if you take out the physical investment side, the ETFs that John's just been talking about, uh, that figure becomes 62% of total demand. And if you take out physical investment and take out jewelry, which of course is quite significant for platinum, it's about 25% of total demand, much less than that for palladium. If you take out jewelry as well, you get to the figure of 76%, so over three quarters of the demand for platinum group metals is in some shape or form as a catalyst. And that's great for our industry, actually, as manufacturers, because PGM make the world a cleaner and more efficient place. And that's uh, if, you're, if you're trying to argue the sustainability for PGM mining, opposed to other industries, is a very nice argument to have in your, in your bag. Um, now, I, I, I'm going to talk about why people use PGMs as catalysts, just very briefly, and I've got two slides on this. One is what I've said for the fine minds. So those of you who might have a technical background or, or who are turned on by this kind of stuff, I'll talk about it in that way, but then I'm going to talk about it as well for, for the rest of us. And, and there's a guy, uh, Professor Jeffrey Bond, Emeritus Professor of Chemistry at Brunel University in the UK, has come up with two very good explanations of why PGM is a good catalyst. And the first one here talks about the fact that it, a good catalyst chemisorbs, so it bonds, if you like, to, uh, to the things that you want to react. Okay? Um, and but, but a good catalyst, it holds on to them for a little time, but long enough for those reactants to react, and then it lets them go again. And this is when you, when you hear about people talking about catalytic selectivity, why well, it's a good catalyst to select for, uh, for a particular reaction, this is what they're talking about. So if you had um, like an alkyne, C2H2, uh, and you, you wanted to react that to an alkene, C2H4, for example, then you'd use palladium, because it'll hold on to it long enough to add one hydrogen molecule, and then it'll let it go. If you use platinum, it'll take it all the way to an alkane, so it'll add two hydromolecules before it lets it go. So this is the selectivity that people talk about in catalysts. And what it ultimately comes down to is the number of free electrons in the D shell, uh, particularly for blazing out, so I'm not going to focus on that, but that, that determines how reactive it's going to be and how long it's going to hold on to something. Okay? So that's the technical side of it. Few gems of catalysts for the rest of us, I thought I'd, I'd try and give you some sort of analogy here. If you think of uh, sibling rivalry, young brother and sister. They don't want to really speak to each other, they don't want to know each other, they, uh, they really certainly don't want to touch each other, and frankly they, they really don't want to have anything to do with each other whatsoever, okay? And that, if you like, is a very bad catalyst. And that's what things are like on the right-hand side of the periodic table, okay? the, the noble gases. They would be very, very bad catalysts. If you go to the other extreme, you've got the, the young lovers, or the lovebirds in this case, um, <laughs> These things, that once they get together, they stick together for life, okay? They bond and they stay together forever. That's a pretty rubbish catalyst. It's sweet, but it's kind of rubbish catalyst as well because you don't want them to stick together forever. They want to let things go. So that's, that's the left-hand side of the 
really. So once you're in your alkali, in your alkali earth metals, okay, rubbish catalysts. Um, and then somewhere in the middle, you've got kind of the doting relationship of the grandfather and the grandchild. He's only in your life for a little bit of time, okay, before he moves on, maybe passes away. Um, but while he's with you, he touches your life forever and changes it. Okay? And that's where the PGN come in. Okay, so think, think of it that way. Okay. Um, okay, so major non catalytic applications of PGM. Um, probably most of you are aware of these, these major ones. So 8% um, of total PGM demand in some shape or form is in the electronics industry. You have a lot of platinum in, in hard disks. Plating is used universally as a, as a plating uh, uh, material in passive components. Rhodium used in thermocouples for temperature measurement as well as some plating. And ruthenium, like platinum, is used extensively in, in hard disks, particularly in perpendicular magnetic recording. Quite solid, strong, uh, strong area. The electronics industry comes to going. It goes cyclically, but it's generally growing pretty strongly. And that um, demand is difficult to replace. Blading, to a certain extent, is substitutable um, by gold, so you wouldn't want to do that at the moment. Um, to a certain extent, some of the active applications can be replaced by nickel and base metals, but that's already happened. So what is left is pretty strong demand. You know, people only use PGM when they have to in the first place, so it's quite difficult to replace it. Um, if you look at the glass industry, that accounts for about 3% of total PGM demand. Um, platinum rhodium used very widely as a, a um, component for melting glass. And this is very important at the moment with the growth in LCD glass because it's, it's melted at very high temperatures, uh, which needs um, very high temperature materials to, to contain the glass and to prevent it from becoming contaminated. So that's a strong demand area and really not possible to, to, to replace with, with anything that I can think of. Um, and increasingly, actually, we're seeing iridium used in the glass industry because of its extreme high temperature properties and very good corrosion resistance. Um, 3% of the total demand likewise found in dental reconstructions. Um, Batman palladium use, and this is a bridge work here, we're not talking about fillings, this is like dental bridge work. Um, this is to a certain extent price elastic, um, but again the main competition comes from gold. So at the moment palladium, uh, high palladium alloys are very strong, strongly in demand in the dental industry. Long term there's competition there coming from ceramics which are obviously more aesthetically pleasing and, and have become viable with uh, computer-aided design um, uh, manufacturing. Um, so they're, those are fairly, they're, they're solid demand, but they're not, they're not going anywhere exciting. Um, now, jewelry and, and physical investment account respectively from 16 and 9% of the total PGM demand. So you add all that lot together, there's still 4%, all right, or three quarters of a million ounces or 25 tons of PGM that are used every year in other demand applications. And that's really what, I, what I'm going to talk about. Um, so there's a, a wide variety of, of things which I'm going to go into. Um, some of them a bit squeamish, um, so you might want to turn away a couple of these slides. Yeah. Um, but why do people use PGM? And, and the first thing I want to talk about is temperature. So the PGM have very, very high melting points, ranging from 1554, that's palladium, up to uh, 3035 osmium. Put that in perspective, palladium, that's the lowest melting point of any PGM, that's higher than stainless steel, which melts at about 15, 1510, something like that. Um, sorry, I talk centigrade in being European. Um, Osmium 3035, that's higher than any of the refractory metals. Um, Tungsten melts about 2980, I think. So, very high melting points, and that leads to a lot of niche applications for PGM. I don't know if people have heard about iridium being used an awful lot lately in crucibles for growth of single metal oxides. Sapphire is, is, is artificially grown as a single crystal, which is being used as a substrate for LEDs. Demand for LEDs taking off exponentially because of backlit LED TVs. This is a very strong demand area, uh, a niche application for, for iridium. Um, another niche area, turbine blades. Every time you go in, in, a, in a jet airplane, the first one, two, sometimes three rows of turbine blades in that jet engine are coated with platinum aluminum. Um, that is in order to protect them from erosion and corrosion. So you've got very high temperature, fairly nasty um, gases combusting and they need platinum to protect them. And also, if you can see the little holes here in, in the turbine blades, to prevent them from overheating, they have cooling channels in them. And when the turbine blades are cast, they put a ceramic car, a core inside the, inside the investment hold, uh, which is pinned in place with platinum while you actually cast the turbine blade. And then you, you, you pull the ceramic core out afterwards. The platinum dissolves into the, uh, into the turbine matrix. So uh, turbine blades widely, widely used in, uh, in all aero engines. Um, next area is, 
talk about is, is what are called nobility. The platinum group metals are sometimes known as the noble metals. Um, and it's, it's almost counterintuitive that although the PGMs are very good catalysts, uh, they're also characterized by the fact that they themselves are highly resistant to chemical attack. Um, and that makes them ideal candidates for, again, high temperature, very corrosive uh, environments. So this thing here is called a bursting disk. In the uh, process chemical industry, if you're, if you're operating, you're making uh, nasty chemicals at high temperature and pressure, you have to have a pressure release valve in there in case the pressure goes too high and the whole thing blows up. So they use a thing called a bursting disk, which literally bursts um, if the pressure builds up over, over a regulated level. Um, if it's a very corrosive chemical that you're operating with, you obviously have to have something that's not going to corrode away and burst when you don't want it to burst. So people use platinum-based um, bursting disk, platinum gold usually, um, and likewise, in laboratory apparatus, crucibles, which are used for all sorts of um, chemical analysis, high temperature chemical analysis, x ray fluorescence analysis, where you have to melt and fuse uh, various uh, salts. Platinum laboratory apparatus is, 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 is widely used around the world. Um, next area is electrical stability. Um, the electrical properties of the PGM are extremely um, stable and predictable. Um, and this is really as a function of the nobility and the strength and the temperature uh, resistance of them, which leads to those stable properties. Um, and I can, I can guarantee that everyone in this room will have platinum in their home somewhere, um, and, or, or in their car. Uh, if, if this, is a, uh, this is a lambda sensor which is used in diesel vehicles. It, it senses the oxygen level in the exhaust fumes of the car, and that feeds back to the onboard diagnostics and controls the fuel injection system. Um, so diesel's not that big in the States yet, it's more than 50% of the European car market is diesel, as Erica touched on earlier. They will all have one of these in them. But most of you guys probably, uh, if you will have, you have smoke detectors in your house, these days people are moving towards carbon monoxide sensors in their house as well. Carbon monoxide sensors are based on a platinum, it's a plat screen printed platinum on palladium um, catalysts, which are very sensitive to changes in the carbon monoxide content of the air in your house. Um, they'll set the alarm off, carbon monoxide goes to your mind, and, and they're all based on, on platinum. So somewhere or other, you're never far from, from platinum. Um, another area which is very important um, as a growing area in PGM demand is um, in, in the biomedical industry because of the biomedical compatibility of platinum. And what I mean by that is platinum, you can stick a bit of platinum in someone's body and the immune system won't try and fight it but nor will uh, it cause other things to happen. It'll just sit there as if it weren't there. Um, and that makes it an ideal candidate for permanent implants in the body. Um, so if anyone has a pacemaker here, that will very likely have a platinum or a platinum iridium um, alloy uh, electrode, which is shown here. This is literally screwed into the heart muscle um, to control the, uh, the electrical stimulation of the heart. Um, and this is what the whole device looks like. So that little bit at the end there is platinum. You have the pacing lead, and that's joined to the uh, pulse generator, uh, which they put under your, under your collar bone. Um, but increasingly, uh, we're seeing PGM platinum use not just in the pacing or in the defibrillator market, but also in, in aneurysm coils, in pain relief, and, and more recently in, in uh, the treatment of Parkinson's disease, which is looking quite, uh, quite promising where they're looking at deep brain uh, stimulation by uh, platinum electrodes. Um, this is um, obviously in terms of price elasticity, price doesn't matter for the applications. The price of the PGM is a very, very small part of the total cost of the component or of the, or of the medical procedure. Um, so it, it's really not important and it's growing fast. About 150,000 ounces of uh, platinum goes into this application every year. Um, moving on to another application of PGM to get in, in, a, in the medical field but for a different reason. Um, platinum is radio opaque, which means it shows up under X ray. Um, now, if you're going to have a heart, if you've got heart problems, if you've got blockages of the heart, in the old days, and they still do mainly in Europe, um, we don't have such a well-funded medical industry, uh, they'll, they'll saw your chest bone open with a circular saw, they'll prise it open with heart jacks, and they'll mess with your heart with knives, okay? And, and it's pretty invasive. Uh, what they try to do these days, and what we certainly have a lot of these days, is if you have a blockage, which you can see here in the little arteries feeding the heart muscles, that's the part that's built up there. What they try to do these days is, is they'll, they'll spot that in advance, and using a catheter, they'll go into the femoral artery in your leg, and they'll push the catheter up to the blockage, and then they'll inflate a balloon, 
and push the back to either side of the artery, and then they'll usually leave what's called a stent in place to keep the artery open. And why is that relevant to Patman? It's because the doctor is putting a thing into your femoral artery, which is about two meters away from, from your heart by the time he's gone through all the torture through the arteries. He has no idea when he's got some blockage. So he uses a fluoroscope to look for when the balloon has reached blockage. And if you see these little black markers here, there's a book called platinum marker bands. They show up under x-ray. So in real time, the doctor can actually see that he's positioned the, uh, the, the, the catheter in the right place. So again, that's another growing use for, for PGM, mainly for platinum, um, and uh, obviously not particularly price sensitive. Uh, another medical area, um, not at all well known this one, but uh, most countries these days have a, a screening program for, for breast cancer um, uh, for, for, for women when you reach a certain age. Um, and um, what, you, what you need, obviously, to take an x-ray of a breast is, is quite powerful x-rays. What you don't want is to burn the tissue. Um, and it, it just so happens that rhodium um, has the right absorption edge. Um, it, it, it prevents harmful x-rays from getting through it and only releases those x-rays which you need to give a good picture of the, uh, of the breast. And so every single mammography unit around the world, and there are several tens of thousands of them, will uh, have a, a rhodium filter contained in it. Um, again, not at all price sensitive. Hopefully what you see or you don't want to see is things like that showing up on the x-ray, um, which obviously look like the beginning of a, of a cancer. Um, another one in the, in, the, in the medical industry, and these are great areas for demand because of course you know they are not price sensitive and, and they're a very good message for the industry in general, um, is in chemotherapy. And this was discovered actually accidentally. Um, there was a research scientist who was working in his lab trying to um, uh, understand the relationship between electrical current and the rate of growth of bacteria. And he found in one experiment that the bacteria weren't growing at all, there was no cell division going on. So he repeated the experiment, found the same thing again, gradually eliminated all the potential causes. And what he found in the end was that the platinum electrodes that he was using had formed an organometallic compound which was preventing cell replication in the bacteria. And what platinum what they, what they subsequently found was that the platinum molecules, organometallic molecules, literally lodges itself across the twin strands of your DNA and prevents, physically prevents replication of your cells. Um, so platinum uh, anti-cancer drugs, which inhibit cell replication, have become widely used as one of the very many different types of anti-cancer drugs. Um, and, and they've achieved extremely high success rates, in, particularly in a couple of uh, specific types of cancer. Um, again, that's, uh, that's only about 30,000 ounces of, uh, of platinum a year, but it's, uh, it's a growing area and uh, completely uh, resistant to economic uh, downturn, I would say. Um, and then finally, um, pretty nasty one, this um, radiation treatment. Um, nasty for the men, this. It's, uh, it's all about prostate uh, gland treatment. Um, some isotopes of the PGM are extremely radioactive but have very short half-lives. And that's the perfect combination if you need to treat a very aggressive cancer without damaging everything on the body that you're going through to treat it. So you implant uh, a, a radioactive device. And in this case, what you see here are platinum sheathed iridium platinum wires, which are implanted as a temporary implant. Unfortunately, that's temporary. Uh, into the prostate gland. They stay there for a few days, they irradiate, they hopefully kill the cancer, and then they're removed. Alternatively, you can actually have seeds implanted, which are permanent implants, and these would be made of, starting point would be rhodium, actually, which you bombard with the protons to knock out a neutron, and make palladium-103, an isotope of palladium, which is very highly uh, aggressive in terms of its radiation. A lot of people, a lot of gamma rays come off that. Um, but it has a short life of only a few days. So again, it's an ideal candidate for, for aggressive uh, cancers. And uh, th again, this has been very successful, and it's kind of a painless approach to uh, prostate cancer treatment. And I, I think is my final slide. Rush through there a little bit to try and get a bit of time. Um, happy to take questions about that, or, or in general about the PGM fundamentals. Sí, <laughs> <laughs>